Echolocation is a pretty straightforward topic really, it's just the idea of sending out a pulse and waiting for it to return, it to echo back to you and timing how far that is and using that to work out distance to a place. Subscribe and ring the bell because this is Gorilla Physics. Other channels show you the content but I'm going to help you get the grade 9. In this video I'm going to show you how to master the questions about echolocation. To understand it, you need to have some kind of basic ideas down before you go on. So make sure you know these. What's the, the equation that links wave speed, frequency and wavelength? Well, that is wave speed equals frequency times wavelength, V is F lambda. And what that really means is that the wave speed is fixed in any given kind of medium. You also need to know the equation which links distance, speed and time. And we remember that as distance S equals speed V times time T. Distance is speed times time because we're going to use that to work out a distance. But although this is a really easy idea to get your head around, there is this idea to make sure that you don't mess up the questions that the wave has actually traveled twice the distance to the object because it's traveled there and back. So make sure you look out for those. Lastly, what does wave speed depend upon? Well, wave speed only depends upon the medium that the wave is traveling in. It's fixed in any given medium. So the speed of sound is always the same in air. The speed of sound is always the same in water. It's always the same in a solid. So because we know the wave speed, we can therefore use time to work out distances. And that's the principle of echolocation. So what do all these things have in common? Well, they're all things that use sonar. Now, sonar means sound waves being used for echolocation, basically sound waves are being emitted from a source and then we're waiting for the pulse to be echoed back to us. A dolphin does this, a bat does this. They don't actually perform calculations but they do get this kind of sense of how far things are away from them using that reflected pulse and how long it takes to come back. In a submarine they send out sonar and it reflects back off objects and therefore they can know what is around them underneath the water. And we actually use this in cars, we use this now um, on rear and also front bumpers to do parking sensors. There is an ultrasound position sensor, there's actually four of them on this Bentley here and they are sending out pulses of ultrasound so you can't hear it but they are sending it out and they are measuring the time it takes for that pulse to come back and from that working out the distance so they don't bump their Bentley into any objects. So what's the difference between these? Because these are all using waves for imaging and waves to find out things, but uh, they're doing them in different ways. So for example, the dolphin is using sonar. So these large dishes here, that is actually being used to measure distances to objects in our solar system. That uses radar, it's the same idea, it's still a echolocation technique, but it is using radio waves rather than sound waves. This is a prenatal scan, this is an ultrasound scan. Ultrasound means the wave, it is a sound wave that is above the audible spectrum, so it is 200,000 hertz or higher is the waves that we cannot hear ultrasound. But the ultrasound scan is what's going on here and that is a prenatal scan, it's scanning an unborn fetus and that uses pulse echo location as well. Lastly, that is an x-ray, that is the odd one out in a way because that is not a pulse echo technique, that is a transmission technique. So it is using waves, it's using x-rays and the waves are either passing straight through the soft tissue or they're being absorbed by the bone and that leaves us with this negative image that we can see the bone. So more on x-rays when we learn about the electromagnetic spectrum in a different video. So four things can happen at a boundary. Waves can be reflected, refracted, transmitted, or they can be absorbed. These are the four things that you need to get your head around. Um, now these descriptions are jumbled up, okay? You could pause it now and you could actually uh, figure out which one you think is which. So a change in direction caused as waves pass through a boundary between mediums as they change speed, that is refraction. So refraction happens because a wave speeds up or slows down. It changes direction because of that change in speed. So waves traveling through a boundary, that is being transmitted. If a wave does not pass through but does change direction, that is reflection. If the energy of the wave is actually taken in by the atoms of the medium, that's absorption. So here's a really simple kind of gap fill exercise that you can pause and have a little go if you like. This is a description, a really simple description. If they ask you to describe how echolocation works, then this is what you would do. So basically a wave pulse is sent from a transmitter to a boundary and the pulse is then reflected at the boundary and this is the echo. The receiver registers the returning pulse and measures the time between the pulse and the echo being received. And using a known wave speed, the device can calculate the distance the wave has traveled using the equation distance is speed times time. 
Ultrasound scans give us loads of benefits, and the main one being that we can scan unborn fetuses. Um, ultrasound scans are non-ionizing, so they're safe to use on these unborn fetuses. And that's really important because we can't do x-rays because of the chance that we could ionize some cells and cause cancer. Because of that, you could get a DNA mutation and cause cancer. So we use ultrasound instead when we're dealing with unborn fetuses. Essentially, there's a transmitter, which is also a receiver, and it sends out repeated pulses. So this is an important difference between ultrasound scanners and other echolocation devices. The fact that there's these repeated pulses going out. There's a short gap in between those pulses and needs to be because there needs to be time for the reflected pulse to come back. An ultrasound wave is partially transmitted and partially reflected at each boundary. So the point is that some of the wave keeps going through to another boundary. So we can actually see multiple boundaries within them instead of just like most ultrasound position sensors, we're just reading the distance to one boundary. And also we can use something called Doppler shift, which is a perceived change in wavelength. And ultrasound scans can actually be used to measure the rate of blood flow in veins. So when you get an ultrasound scan of an unborn fetus, you actually can see the blood flowing through their veins and they can work out whether it's flowing in the right, right direction at the right speed, whether valves are opening and shutting at the right time. It's amazing. So here are some more details about ultrasounds. Remember, it's partially transmitted and partially reflected from each boundary. That's what you can see in the image here. You can see each pulse is being partially reflected and partially transmitted through each boundary. So you get a graph like the one in the right hand corner here with peaks that correspond to the time at which each reflection is received. Higher density tissues, they actually absorb more of the ultrasound. So you do get different sizes of peaks. And larger differences in density is when the density changes that you get that boundary and you get reflection. And the larger differences in density gives us more intense reflections. But when they use an ultrasound, they actually put a gel on the ultrasound receiver on the outside of the skin, which has a similar density to skin and fat. And that means that more of that first initial wave is actually transmitted through that first boundary, i.e. the skin. It's really useful for diagnosis because it's non-ionizing. It gives you a live, like moving picture of whatever you're looking at. You can see a heartbeat if that's what you're interested in. And you can also see that Doppler shift rate of flow of blood. That's really useful for swatting blood clots or problems with hearts and, and for diagnosing heart problems in unborn fetuses. It can also give you really detailed images of soft tissues, which x-rays can't really do. So it can give you really good diagnosis of muscle injuries. Sometimes ultrasound can even be used for treatment. For example, the vibrations can be used to break kidney stones apart. It can be used for muscle relaxation and it can be used to treat tendinitis or arthritis as well. So here are some tricky questions on calculating distances using ultrasounds. There's some speeds given and you have to pick the right speed to use. I'm going to go through these in a second, but pause the video and have a go yourself because that is the best way to learn. Here we go then, let's have a go. So this first one is about a submarine, so we're going to use the speed of sound in water. It receives an echo from a large whale 12.2 seconds after sending the sonar pulse. The time is 12.2 seconds, and that's after sending the sonar pulse. So that is the time for it to get there and back. And speed is the speed of sound in water, which is 1500 meters per second. The equation we're going to use is distance is speed times time. So it is 1500 times 12.2. And I'm gonna just put this in here now because I know that that is the distance all the way there and back. I'm going to divide by two now. Always use the calculator rather than try and do things in your head. 9,150 meters. The next question is in the context of a ship. So once again, we're using the speed of sound in water. A ship surveying the deepest fjords in Norway sends sonar pulses to measure the depth. Successive sonar pulses in one position give these results. There's five results there. So my first thoughts are, well, I'm gonna have to calculate an average. And whenever they give you a set of results like that, before you calculate an average, you should always look at them and check there are no anomalies. Hopefully you can see that actually the fourth one is very different to the others. So I'm going to calculate the average time taken for the pulse to get there and back and I'm going to ignore that anomaly. So now I've got my average time taken. Now I'm going to calculate the distance by using distance is speed times time, bearing in mind that that is the time to get there and back. So I'm going to have to divide my result by two. Speed is 1500 times by my average time. I'm going to use all the significant figures until the last possible moment. And now I can round to two significant figures if I like. That is how deep the fjords are in Norway. They're very deep. The next questions have some other ways they've been made more tricky. 
So a plane receives a reflection of a radar pulse 30 microseconds. So that's the time. So the time is 30 microseconds, which is 30 times 10 to the minus six seconds after sending it. Calculate the distance between the plane and the distant object. So this is a radar pulse. So that is using radio waves, radar. So that is the speed of light that we use as the speed, which is 300 million meters per second. Now, just for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna use standard form here, and we know speed of light in a vacuum is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Now I can use my distance is speed times time. And again, I'm gonna do this multiplied by that, and I'm going to divide it by two, because it's the time to get there and back. 4,500 meters. So four and a half kilometers, I could convert that to if I wished. That does seem a sensible distance when we're talking about radar used on airplanes. There's lots of ways they've made this one more complicated. A fishing boat receives two echoes from the echolocation system. The time and apparent amplitude of these pulses are shown in the table. Use calculations to deduce what depth the fishing boat should cast their net. So deduce means you have to use calculations to make a conclusion. And then there's another command word, suggest reasons for there being two distinct different pulses received. Well, what's actually going on here is that one of those pulses is a shoal of fish that they wish to cast their net on. And the second pulse is actually a reflection from the ocean ocean floor. So let's have a little go with working out the distance to the shoal of fish. That is going to be the shorter um, pulse. And again, we're going to use the same equation and we're going to use the speed of sound in water as our speed. So the time I'm going to use is 0.23 seconds. The so distance is speed times time, 1500 times 0.23 divided by, and it is in seconds, divided by two. One hundred and seventy two point five meters. I could calculate the other one, but I actually don't need to because I think that's the shoal of fish depth. But I am going to use the data in terms of the relative amplitude to suggest reasons for there being two distinct pulses being uh, received. Whenever it asks you to deduce, you should always give a conclusion as a sentence. Okay, and then it says suggest reasons for there being two distinct pulses. So my reason is going to be based around this idea of one of the pulses being from the shoulder fish and the other one being the seabed. Now, because they've given me the data, I want to actually use some of that information they've given and add value to it. So I'm going to explain that I know this because the amplitude of the shoulder fish is a lot less than the amplitude of the echo from the seabed. And the key word there that I have to get in there to get the mark is this. The word less makes it a comparison. I haven't just requoted the data. I haven't said, well, the amplitude from the shoal was 0.22 and the amplitude from the seabed was 0.78. I have compared the data by using that word less. That's a really important word not to miss out for your answers. This is a really good example of this type of question and how they make questions hard at GCSE or indeed A-level by giving you a really tricky context. You read this and you, you're thinking about these planets, dwarf planets, but what do I actually have to do? Well, to work that out, you need to look out for the command words. And the command word in this one is calculate. So calculate the distance to these dwarf planets. Okay, we're using radar here to measure distances in our solar system. And we do actually do that. Right? We use radar to measure distances to objects in our solar system. So we're gonna use the speed of light in the vacuum again. That's three times 10 to the eight. So what do I know? I know that the speed is the speed of light in the vacuum. That's three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And I know three times, but they're all in hours. So time, first of all, when I read it, 10, 12, and 18 hours respectively. So that's Haumea Makimaki, which is an amazing name for a planet, isn't it? Or a dwarf planet, and Eris. Okay, so um, the time to Haumea, let's just do it, time to Haumea is 10 hours. Um, the time to Makimaki is 12 hours. And the time to Eris is just, what is 18 hours. 
Okay, so I need to convert those into seconds because my speed's in meters per second and my time's in hours, so I need to use coherent units. So you can just remember that one hour has 3,600 seconds in it. Or you can just think, well, that one hour is 60 minutes and each minute has 60 seconds. So you just time 60 times 60 to get hours into a second. So it's a good practice to make sure that you actually convert before you go ahead and do any calculations. Now I've got all of my times figured out. Now I can use my equations. Distance is speed times time. And I've got to remember that the, these times are the time for the pulse to come back. So I have to divide my answers by two. So let's say distance to Halmir is three times 10 to the eight times 36,000 divide by two. I'll do that in a second. Distance to Maki Maki is three times 10 to the eight times 43,200 over two and then distance to uh, Eris is 3 times 10 to the 8 times 64,800 all over 2. Just type the numbers in the calculator. So luckily I'd shown my working out so I could check this when I'd done this one. This one seemed a bit too small. This certainly isn't a power power of 10 out. So um, I could check that, put that back through the calculator because I'd shown my working. So I hope that helped. That is echolocation in depth, including all the really hard questions that they can give you. So one more command word that can be really tricky is suggest. And I would suggest that these are the hardest command words that they can give you because it's where you have to apply your knowledge to a new situation, but you also need to come up with something for yourself. It's not something specifically written in the specification. You need to know this, but you need to be able to apply something you do know to solve a particular problem. So suggest reasons why sonar might may not be used for location of aeroplanes, but can be used for location of submarines. Well, that is about the speed of the two types of wave. So sound wave has a speed of about 330 meters per second in air, but it has a speed of 1500 meters per second underwater. So it's a lot faster in water. So because the airplane might be traveling either faster than the speed of sound or at least a significant portion of it, then that is not a very good way to accurately locate the aircraft. But a submarine is unlikely to be moving anywhere like 1500 meters per second. So that can be used to accurately locate a submarine underwater. So suggest reasons why radar may not be used for measuring distance underwater, but is used for measuring distances in our solar system. Well, that's not this time about the speed, but it's actually about the absorption. So water will absorb radar waves. So we can't really use radar underwater. We can use it in air because the absorption due to air is not very much, but it can definitely be used in a vacuum in space. So reasons why ultrasound is used for scanning unborn fetuses rather than x-rays. Well, there's actually two main reasons. And the first being, that it's non-ionizing, so x-rays are ionizing radiation. So if you were to cause a DNA mutation in a fetus and lead to cancer, that cell would be replicated very quickly and it could lead to much more serious potential health issues than if you were using x-ray on an adult. So ultrasound, the reason the mark would be for saying ultrasound is non-ionizing and wouldn't lead to cancer. But also ultrasound gives us moving images. So that is a very useful thing. And in ultrasound, you can actually use Doppler shift to analyze the rate of blood flow in the fetus's veins and arteries. So for everybody, the first layer of an ultrasound has to go through is the layer of cutaneous fat. That's the fat underneath the skin, basically. Why obesity can lead to less reliable ultrasound diagnosis? Well, ultrasound is absorbed as it moves through any tissue, okay, more or less, depending on how thick that tissue is. So if there's a large layer of fat in the way, then too much of the wave is actually being absorbed before it gets to the fetus that we're actually interested in, in scanning. So I have a very important point to make that is when something seems easy, like the idea of echolocation is very easy. You simply send a pulse and you wait for the reflection and you time it. And from that, you work out the distance. Although the idea is easy, they can still ask you some really difficult questions. So when you're revising, it's not just about understanding something. It's about being able to solve these really difficult questions that they can ask you. They can ask you difficult questions about the easy parts and they can ask you easy questions about the hard parts of physics. But you need to make sure that you are capable of handling the easy stuff 
and the hard stuff. And that only comes with lots and lots and lots of practice of the hardest bits. Thank you very much for watching Gorilla Physics. I do hope that's helped. I hope that was useful. Let me know by hitting the like button and I'll see you at gorillaphysics.com and subscribe for more videos. Thanks a lot for watching all about pulse echo technique. Thank you.